Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for our Bible study tonight. It's always a joy. Whenever we gather before you, Lord, we know that Christ will come. One day he will come in glory. And we pray, Lord, all of us who are here, all those who will be hearing the word through cassette or any other means, prepare every one of us to meet you in peace, in holiness, without spot, without blame, in Jesus' name. We're asking, Lord, today you open our eyes to see. Help us to understand. Enlighten our heart. Help us, Lord, that your glory alone will be revealed in us and through us in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Let's all be seated. We continue in our study of the scriptures and in our systematic expository study of the word of God. We're now in Second Peter chapter 3. We started from chapter 1, as you know. And we've been going verse after verse, chapter after chapter. And the Lord has been leading us to some deep, great truths of his word. In this uh, third chapter of Second Peter, I already told you that Peter was concerned that the people of God, the children of God, the believers, will not be swept away from their steadfastness. Because there were doubters, unbelievers, false prophets, false teachers, scoffers that were coming to the midst of the people. And they were trying to sow the seed of corruption and the seed of deception and the seed of error and the seed of false doctrine in the midst of the people of God. And they were trying to take away their hope, their confidence that Christ will come again. That's the reason why the Apostle Peter, led by the Spirit of God, inspired by the Spirit of God, took time in this chapter 3 to call the believers back to their steadfast hope that Christ is still coming again. And last week, as we looked at verses 1, 2, 3, and 4, he reminded us that we should remember the word already spoken by the Old Testament prophets, and then remember the word spoken and taught by the New Testament apostles. And as we bring both things together, it's telling us the Old Testament and the New Testament, they combine together to tell us that Christ is coming again. As you look at your Bible at the word of God, there are 333 prophecies concerning Christ. As you look at the Old Testament, 109 of those prophecies were fulfilled when Christ came the first time. And it remains 224 prophecies to be fulfilled at the second coming of Christ. And therefore the apostle is assuring us, don't you think that if 109 prophecies had been fulfilled concerning Christ, prophecies that were given thousands of years before he came don't you understand that the prophecies too about the second coming of christ will surely be fulfilled but then he picked up the uh, scoffers and he said in verse 3 knowing this first that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own laws is saying for the real believer that is the bible believing christian Actually, uh, the appearance of these coffers is not a surprise. It's been prophesied already. And as you think about what has been prophesied already and fulfilled, then it gives you the confidence that actually the rest of the prophecies will be fulfilled. Take the prophecies concerning the last days, for example. There shall be wars and rumors of wars. It's been fulfilled. Take the prophecy concerning farming and pestilence in diverse places. It's been fulfilled. Take the prophecy about false prophets and false Christ appearing and deceiving many people is being fulfilled. And take the prophecy of because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold is being fulfilled. As you look at the prophecies that are fulfilled already, it gives you the assurance and the confidence that the rest of those prophecies, they are going to be fulfilled too. And so he says, the very fact that the word of God had prophesied that scoffers will come doubters will come the people who argue against the truth they will come and they have now come that shows us then if the prophecy 
concerning the appearance of the scoffers had been fulfilled, then the prophecy concerning the second coming of Christ will definitely be fulfilled. You don't you see, even in this chapter alone, it said there shall come in the last days scoffers, and they are there. And then in this same chapter, there shall be false teachers among you who privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them. And that has been fulfilled already. Those who backslide and become scoffers, they are fulfilling prophecies. Because already it says, in the last days, very lost times shall come, men shall be lovers of themselves, that's been fulfilled. And there will be people that contradict the truth of God. That's been fulfilled. And there will be people who have just the shallow, shell, superficial profession of godliness. But they deny the power thereof. That's been fulfilled. And as you see that even backsliding was prophesied. That it will happen. And it is happening. When somebody backslides then... It shouldn't come to a believer, a Bible believer, as a surprise. If you believe the Bible, that's prophecy. And it gives you confidence that if the prophecy concerning backsliders, scoffers, unbelievers, doubters, war, famine, pestilence, sickness, in diverse places, if those prophecies are being fulfilled, of course, the prophecy concerning Christ too will be fulfilled. It came as a surprise to the apostles when they learned that one of you will betray me because they didn't understand that the prophecy was there. You find it in the Psalms. You find it in other parts of the Old Testament. It didn't come to Jesus as a surprise that somebody was backsliding because it was prophecy. And heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. And so they were asking, is it I? Is it I? And they were sorrowful. But Jesus with confidence, knowing all things that are written about me must be fulfilled. He said, I'll show you who he is. And even when he showed them and put the food in his mouth and said, and then Judas Iscariot said, is it I? And Jesus said, you have said so. Don't you know? The deal you've made with the Pharisees and the scribes, don't you know? The others still didn't understand. Because they didn't understand that the word of God will definitely be fulfilled. And I'm here to tell you that every judge and every title of the word of God will be fulfilled. You see the willful ignorance of contemporary religious people and preachers today. It's not even surprising. The Spirit of God had won God's people ahead of time. The Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith. It's in our Bible. And it's in that Bible in your hand. So when somebody then, who had claimed to be saved and sanctified and baptized in the Holy Ghost, somebody who had been fervent and loyal and faithful, Somebody who had shared with us of their same word of eternal life. When that person leaves the faith, departs from the faith, becomes a doubter, an unbeliever, a scoffer, a false prophet, a false teacher. And then we're crying as if, how can this happen? It will happen. It's happened to some already. And before Jesus comes, it may still happen to a lot of people because it says the Spirit of God is speaking pointedly, plainly, clearly, expressly, that some shall depart from the faith. And you'll be surprised the kind of doctrines they believe after they depart from the faith. It says they'll be giving heed to seducing spirits, deceiving spirits, enticing spirits, and doctrines of devils. Instead of being surprised, instead of being shocked, when you see it happen, you should have more confidence in God and in the word of God. And we should also be on our guard so that we ourselves do not become backsliders and scoffers in fulfillment of prophecy. My brother, my sister, look up here. When you see yourself backsliding, when you see yourself departing from the faith, wake up 
and say prophecy is being fulfilled on me if i'm not careful this prophecy will envelop me will blanket me will encircle me and it will take me away completely from the faith and i'll not be able to find my steps or find my way back again when you find yourself that you are becoming cold your love for god your devotion to god and your earnestness in following the things of god when you find you are getting cold Instead of saying, it is just like that now. It's because of the new babies we had. It's because I just got married. It's because of this, my new job. It's not because of this or because of that. It's because of prophecy being fulfilled upon your life. When you find yourself that you are being deceived into error. And the things you couldn't do before. And the things you will not do before. And the things you will not look at before. And the things you will not hear before. And the places you will not go before. And the friends you will not keep before. And the thoughts you will not even entertain before. It's coming into your heart. And you say, my love is waxing cold. It looks like I'm not as prayerful. I'm not as zealous. I'm not as violent as I used to be. I'm not as devoted, consecrated as I used to be. Maybe it's just happening. No. That is a fulfillment of prophecy. That's the time you need to wake up and say, prophecy is being fulfilled on me. Let me wake up before the prophecy takes the total, uh, the total effect upon my life. And today we're looking at Second Peter chapter three, verses five, six, and seven. Second Peter chapter three, verses five, six, and seven. For this they willingly are ignorant of that by the watch of God the heavens were uphold, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water whereby the world that was then being overflowed with water perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. It tells us that these unbelievers, these doubters, and these backsliders, these false prophets, these coffers, they are willingly ignorant. Understand that? Understand that? They know the truth. They know what it is. They deliberately hold on to error. We're looking at three points in our study today. Number one, the willful ignorance of scoffers and sinners. Deliberate, predetermined, hardened, willful ignorance of scoffers and sinners. Number two, water. The instrument of judgment on past scoffers and sinners. The scoffers had been there before. When Noah was building the ark, repent. God is going to open the fountains of the earth and is going to open the fountains of the sky and water from beneath and water from above will swallow everybody up. Repent. They scoffed, they laughed, they shrugged their shoulders, they disbelieved, they doubted, they convinced themselves my friend, give me another bottle of beer there. All this Noah, righteous, righteous Noah. Water is coming. There's not even a cloud. And there is no dew. And there is no drop at all. It's not even drizzling. And this fellow is saying water is going to come and, you know, sweep everybody up. There will be a mighty flood. Everybody will perish. Please give me my, what I want there. Scoffing. But it happened. And today too, as the Lord is announcing that Christ is coming again. Christ said so. The Father said so. The Spirit of God said so. The angels announced it. And the apostles also proclaimed it. And the whole Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, affirmed everything. Jesus Christ mentioned a second coming about 21 times. And we're warned in the New Testament to be ready for the coming of the Lord more than 50 times. As we see that in the Bible, there are people that are still coughing. And they forget that the old world was destroyed by water. And then after the water came the fire on Sodom and Gomorrah. And the Lord is saying the destruction that is going to come now will not be by water. It will be by fire. Don't disbelieve. Prepare to meet the Lord. Point number three, warning of future fiery punishment for scoffers and sinners. I go to point number one. The willful ignorance of scoffers and sinners. I read the first part of verse 5. Again, Second Peter chapter 3, verse 5. For this, they willingly 
are you ignorant of? This they willingly are ignorant of. The scoffers are willingly ignorant. If you come across the people that say they don't believe in sanctification, nobody can be holy, nobody can be perfect. Yes, they have read, be ye perfect as your father in heaven is perfect. Yes, they have read, he gave some apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints. Yes, they have read, cleanse yourselves from all the filthiness of the flesh and of the spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Yes, they have read all that, but they still say it's impossible. They're willingly ignorant. The word of God is very plain. Their problem is not lack of opportunity to hear or to know the true doctrines of Christ. Their problem is not the lack of intelligence to read, to understand the word of God. Scoffers, doubters, unbelievers are deliberately setting their heart and their mind against the truth. In fact, they'll be searching for arguments to oppose and to contradict the truth of the word of God. What happens is this, my brothers and sisters, they first hold on to error. They don't have any reason for it. They don't understand why it is so. They first hold on to error and to false doctrine. And then, to justify their wrong position, they will offer reasons why others must believe their error and their false doctrines with them. First, they reject the conviction of the Spirit of God and the pleading of concerned believers because of the pride of their hearts. Oh, if I drop that false doctrine, it will appear that so and so conquered me, that he was right, I was wrong. And they're too proud to accept that they could be wrong. They're too proud to leave and to abandon their evil, erroneous ways, and to protect their opinions, and to justify their loose lives, their unholy character, they had in their hearts against the truth. Please understand, those coffers, they first decide what they want to believe. They don't go to the word of God. They decide what they want to believe. And they decide what they do not want to believe. And then they spend their lives looking for something to defend their error. Those coffers decide to be different from the teachers of the truth. It isn't it? It isn't it? Agonizing. Look up here, my brothers and sisters. Uh, let's say somebody has been in a church like this before. And almost every time, Jesus only, Jesus ever, Jesus all in all we see is a savior, a sanctifier, a healer, a baptizer, and the coming king. Every time, every time we sing it. Then when we have retreats or congresses, we deal with the cardinal, solid, foundational truths of scripture. And we go through, and we go through once and again. And we don't say we read it before, we studied it before, we went through again, again, and again. And then, the spirit of backsliding comes upon somebody who had been a preacher here. The spirit of backsliding, hardening the heart, comes upon somebody who had been a worker, a leader, and had preached it himself, and then goes away. The very first thing that individual does, mark my word, mark my word, the very first thing that individual does, all right now, I have left that place, deeper life. Uh-huh. Therefore, I will not preach the same thing. Because if I preach the same thing, what's the reason for my living? To prove that I am different. And I am going to be different. I am not going to emphasize sanctification and holiness. Because if I do, then I will be like them. It will be as if I am still the same with that deeper life. And I am not going to be the same. Because of that, they take away. The very hub, the very center, the very nucleus of what prepares you to be with the Lord in eternity. Because it says, follow peace with all men. And holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. How can somebody seal his own doom just by making up his mind? I don't want to be like those deeper life people. 
I don't want to preach the same thing with those deeper life people because of that. No other reason. Because I'm going to be different and show them that I don't agree with them. You still have Bible, my friend. And the Spirit of God is still there. That except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. Ye shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of God. Why do you cut off your nose to spite your face? What do you think you're opposing deeper life or you're opposing me and just to be different from me? That's the reason you're going to contradict holiness. And then you decide that's what you're going to do. And you make up your mind, harden your conscience. Anywhere you come across holiness and the word, no, that's Kumuyi's doctrine. I am not going to believe it. I'm going to be different. Without holiness, tell me the rest. No man shall see the Lord. So, those coffers, they first decide that this is what they want to believe. And you must not allow the hardness of heart and the obstinacy of scoffers and false prophets to deceive and damn your precious soul. Job chapter 21 verses 14 and 15. Therefore they say unto God, Depart from us, for we desire not the knowledge of thy ways. What is the Almighty? That we should serve him. And what profit should we have if we pray unto him? You see, they made up their minds. They know the Almighty is there. They know God is there. The creator of the heavens and the earth. But they said, please depart from us. We do not desire to know anything about your ways. Willful ignorance. In Psalm 50, verses 16 and 17. Psalm 50, verse 16. But unto the wicked, God says... What hast thou to do to declare my statutes? Or that thou shouldest take my covenant in thy mouth? Seeing thou hatest instruction and castest my words behind thee. You see the deliberate thing there? I learned of a backslider that had got all these cases that she got, bought, Obtained when she was still in the truth, when she still loved the Lord, when he loved, when his love had not waxed cold, and then eventually he backslid, and then he wanted to he gathered all the cassettes together, wanted to throw them away, and somebody who was yearning for heaven said, "Please don't throw them away. If you don't want them, give them to me. I need them. Take, take, take everything you want." I don't want them again. I don't want eternal life again. I don't want sound doctrine again. I don't want the pure, unadulterated word again. You want heaven. You want eternal life. You want the messages there. You can take them. And they sell their souls into perdition. You see, when the spirit of backsliding comes upon an individual, he will cast away the word of God. The thing that will do you good in your life, everything is cast away. A second Chronicles chapter 36, verse 15 and verse 16. And the Lord God of their fathers sent to them by his messengers, rising up betimes and sending, because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked the messengers of God. They mocked the messengers of God. I'm sure you know what it means to mock. They despise them. They made caricature of them. They made fun of their, their preaching, their messages. They dramatized in a way while they were playing. If they leave, you know, the, the preacher, the prophet had said, the Lord is going to destroy this place. The Lord is going to destroy this place. He will destroy this place by war, by famine, by this, by that. After they heard... They will not believe. They will not accept. Then they will be dramatizing among one another how the war will come. How this will happen. And they mock the messengers of God. My friend, if you are doing that today, and you are mocking the word of God, and mocking the messengers of the word of God, 
rejecting the word of God. And you are not only rejecting it, but you are mocking. So that others who want to believe will not believe. So that others who want to stand on this unchanging word will not stand. Maybe you will preach on repentance, will preach on restitution. And then because your heart does not accept, as you are praying, you'll be mocking, mocking repentance, mocking restitution. And you'll be shouting it out loud so that the people around you will know that you are mocking it. And when you go out there, you'll be mocking restitution. <laughs> My friend, when you're talking to your friend, mock him. Have you done your restitution? Because, you know, if you don't do your restitution, you will go to hell. And the other one will reply, mocking. You're not the first one to do that. Others did that before you. Where are they today? Life doesn't continue forever here on earth. You may mock today, but I tell you, the words of the Lord and the words of Jesus Christ, except ye repent, ye shall likewise perish. That's the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord is the word of the eternal king, the God of glory, the ancient of days. It's not something for joking. It's not something for mocking. And it says here, they mocked the messengers of God and they despised his words. And they misused the prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people. So there was no remedy. You see, these people were determined that they will not accept the word of God. But their ignorance was not just a mistake. It was a willful, deliberate ignorance. Isaiah chapter 5. Isaiah chapter 5, verse 24. Therefore, as the fire devoureth stubble, and the flame consumes the chaff, so their root shall be as rottenness. And their blossom shall go up as dust because, because, because they have cast away the law of the Lord of hosts and despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. Therefore is the anger of the Lord kindled against his people. And you see there, because of mocking the word, rejecting the word, because they became unbelievers and doubters and scoffers, and they will not accept the word of God, they will not repent with contrite hearts concerning after they have had the word of God. That's why the flame, fiery judgment, the flaming, fiery judgment of God came upon them. In Jeremiah chapter 6 verse 10, Chapter 6 of Jeremiah, verse 10. To whom shall I speak and give warning that they may hear? Behold, their ear is uncircumcised, and they cannot hack him. Behold, the watch of the Lord is unto them, a reproach. They have no delight in it. They don't even cherish it. They don't want it. They don't desire it. They have no delight in it. In Zechariah chapter 7. Zechariah chapter 7 verses 11 and 12. But they refused to hack him and pulled away the shoulder and taught their ears that they should not hear. Yea, they made their hearts not Satan, they, not God, they. Not even other people, they themselves. They, in verse 12, they made their hearts as an adamant stone. Adamant stone, at that time they discovered, was the hardest of all stones. Difficult to break. And they made their hearts like that, as an adamant stone. Lest they should hear the law and the words which the Lord of hosts had sent in his spirit by the former prophets. Therefore came a great wrath from the Lord of hosts. In Matthew chapter 13, verses 14 and 15. Matthew 13, from verse 14. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which says, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand. I pray this prophecy will not be on you. They will hear, they will not understand. And seeing ye shall see, 
and shall not perceive. For these people's heart is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing. Listen to this. And their eyes, who closed their eyes? Who closed their eyes? They have closed their eyes. Let's at any time, at any time, at any time, at any time, they shall see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their and understand with their heart and should be converted and I shall heal them. Are there not some wives that the husbands are bringing here? And because the husband is a little bit well to do, he has some money to take care of the family. And so because of that, the woman is just following him. Come to church. Come. If you don't come to this, our church with me. Don't expect anything from me. Hey, I will go with you. And so she comes. Sunday after Sunday. Monday after Monday. Thursday after Thursday. But she seals up her heart. She will not hear. And if you see her outside, her dressing, her behavior, her character, you will not know that she ever stepped into a church where they preach repentance, change of life, and transformation of life. She closes her eyes. I will not see. I will not hear. I will not listen to them. And they are not husbands that are following their wives because the wife is the breadwinner, is the one that is paying house rent, is the one that is buying this and buying that, taking care of things. And she is so gentle and humble and submissive. And a man knows that he cannot get another woman like this in the street. And the only thing you can do for me, I know that I'm the breadwinner, I'm earning the money, I'll give you everything, no problem. The only thing you can do for me is to be following me to church. I will follow you. And they come week after week. And they are not born again. And they will not surrender or yield themselves to the watch of the Lord. And there are not people here who have been coming for a long time. And we know that this is the truth of the watch of God. And you have a pastor and a teacher that will emphasize it and emphasize it and emphasize it. And yet, I hear, I will not do. You can shout. You can cry. And you can preach. Prolong your message until you kill yourself in the preaching. Preach. But I am here. I will not live deeper life. I'm not like those people that are running about. I don't have any other place to go. Here, I will die. But whatever you say, whatever you preach, and you cannot drive me away. I will be careful. I will not commit the kind of sin that you will come and make an announcement about me here. That you will drive me away. I will not go. But if you think that I will obey, count me out. That's your cup of tea. That's your good luck. If you, if you sit down there and you make up your mind that you close your eyes to the truth and that you will not repent, and that you will not be converted, and that you will not have a change of life, and that you will not be sanctified, you will not be holy. It's your problem when the trumpet shall sound, and the dead in Christ shall rise, and we which are alive, the wise virgins, when they go away with the bridegroom, and you are left here for the Antichrist to rule over you, you will remember that somebody told you, and I told you week after week, Prepare to meet the Lord your God. But you thought you were being a tough man, a tough woman. By hardening your conscience, by closing your eyes, by refusing to accept the watch of God that prepares you for eternity. You thought you were acting brave. You are acting foolish. If we close our eyes to the truth, to the word of God that is able to save the soul and prepare us for eternity. You are not acting as if you are strong, as if you are brave. You are acting as if you are joking and gambling with your eternal life. But these people here, their eyes, they have closed. Less at any time. 
I shall preach unto them that will make them to be converted. And then it tells us in Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 28. Romans 1 verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. They didn't like it. They had in themselves. They were willfully ignorant. They did not like to retain God in their knowledge. God gave them over to a reprobate mind. To do those things which are not convenient. You better be very careful. If you are deliberately doing wrong things, deliberately doing wrong things, and the Spirit of God is saying, didn't you hear that verse of Scripture the other time? Didn't you hear from the preacher the other time? And you deliberately had in your conscience, there comes a point when God will not waste his time with you anymore. And he'll just push you aside and abandon you to a reprobate mind. And you just continue to do insensible things. And things that are not according to the word of God. And then your mind is depraved. And God just says, leave him alone. Let him continue like that. In Third John. Third John. Verses 9 and 10. So John, verse 9. I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes, who loveth to have preeminence among them, receiveth us not. Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds which he doeth, preaching against us with malicious words, and not content therewith, neither does he himself receive the brethren, and forbiddeth them that would, and casteth them out of the church. Brothers and sisters, can you imagine somebody in the church? And uh, uh, they think that, uh, you know, because uh, the way, Pastor, the way you preach, it looks too forceful. That's why some of the people, uh, that's why they are not accepting. If you can mellow down a little bit and be nice and be tender and be very gentle and be, ple uh, you know, plead for the people. They don't, the way you are doing, that's not, that's the old, old leadership style of Moses. Come on now. Do like John. If you do like John, and you're very loving, and you're very tender, and you're very gentle, and you put your arms around the people, and you plead with them, and you, if you become a pastor, an apostle of love, you will find everybody will fall in line. My friend, John, the beloved, he was there. And he went to the church, and with all his tenderness, and with all his love, and with all his kindness, and with everything that he did, these Diotrephes will not accept the word. And even the people that will accept, he told them, don't accept. And then if they did, he will cast them away from the church. Are there people there? That when you see other people that want to fall in line to the word of God, and they want to give themselves completely to the obedience of the word. You call them and say, what's the matter with you? Did you hear me the other time when I said, when that man talks, we want to show him that nobody is going to listen. And you are listening. And you appear to be following. Be very careful. Because if you don't stop that kind of sheepish obedience and falling in line and just being tender, yielding to the word of God, I will deal with you. And these people, they put themselves there. That if anybody wants to carry out the word of God, wants to obey the word of God, they can even discipline that fellow in their little corner, cast him out of their midst. Because that fellow wants to repent. Because he wants to live right. And because he wants to do well. And because he wants to get to heaven. That's what Diotrephes did. Willful, deliberate, Ignorance of the word of God. I pray God will deliver us. Now we go to point number two. Water, the instrument of judgment on past scoffers and sinners. It tells us in Second Peter chapter 3. The latter part of verse 5 with verse 6. It says that by the word of God, the heavens were of old. And the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. 
Here you will find that it's referring back to the time of the Old Testament. Actually, this is it. The argument of the scoffers is this. Look at it in verse 4. In verse 4, see, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. They said, you're talking about the second coming of Christ. And you're talking about the fact that when Jesus Christ comes, he's going to destroy the world with fire. And then he will create the new heavens and the new earth. They say, how can that happen? Don't you know that since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were before? That was their ignorance, but it was deliberate. And the answer of the Lord to that is, ye do err, you go astray, you make a mistake, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. Because if they knew the scriptures, they would have known that all things did not continue as they were before. Uh, what, the way they were reasoning is this, they said the law of nature is fixed. Like the law of gravity. And since the law of nature is fixed, and since the law of gravity is fixed, nothing can change, nothing will change. Then he said, these people are willingly ignorant because the laws of nature and the law of gravity, all those laws are not above the power of God. In fact, a number of times, the Almighty God had suspended those laws of nature in the past. Didn't he divide the Red Sea? Was that according to the regular, normal, outworking law of nature? He suspended the law of nature. Didn't he translate Enoch from earth to heaven without seeing death? Was that according to the law of nature? Didn't he then suspend the law of nature before you could do that did he not stop the movement of the solar system when joshua was waging war against the enemies of the people of god and the sun stood there and the moon stood there and the rotation of the universe in their orbits everything stopped did he cheat then at that time suspend that law of nature the laws of nature are not above the Almighty God. Come on now, Peter walked on water. Didn't he suspend at that time? The laws of nature. Why are you scoffers and doubters and unbelievers saying, since the world began, everything has continued as it was and it will ever be like that. And then you think because nothing will change, God cannot alter things. Therefore, let's just do whatever we want to do. There is nothing that will change. When Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego got into the fire of Nebuchadnezzar, didn't he suspend the laws of nature at that time? And don't you understand then that he can still do the same thing? He translated Elijah from earth to heaven. He caught away Philip from where he was to another place without any physical, mechanical transportation. And when Peter was in the prison, the angel came and, and smote him, and then the chains fell up. Didn't he suspend the laws of nature then? Because the law of nature is that not, everything remains either in motion until somebody, something stops it, or remains at rest until something moves it. But without touching those chains, everything fell off. And then Peter got up with the angel. When he got to the first door, it opened by itself. And when they got to the iron gate, it opened by itself. Did he not suspend the laws of nature at that time? The laws of nature, they are not above the almighty God. And therefore, those coffers, they were ignorant of the power of the word of God that brought an overflowing flood of water upon the whole world to judge and to destroy it. And the omnipotent creator is still above all the laws of nature and all the arguments of the scoffers. 
That's why you shouldn't listen to these people that uh, they think they're reasonable, they think they're intelligent, they think they're scientific. And the way they reason, they say it will never change because of this, because of this, because of this. And if you don't know all these other scriptures, they will deceive you. In Genesis chapter 6, let's see what God did at that time. Genesis chapter 6, I'm reading to you from verse 5. Genesis 6, verse 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. And that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented, it made him sorry. It repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth. And it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth. Both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air. For it repenteth me that I have made them. In verse 17, it tells us, and behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life from under heaven, and everything that is in the earth shall die. He did it at that time, and the apostle was saying, well, you're saying that everything has been, since the world began, everything has just been going on as it was, so will it ever be? Have you forgotten the history that we read about the flood? In chapter 7, verse 11, in the 600 year of Noah's life, in the second month, the seventeenth day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up, and the windows of heaven were open. Then in verse 12, it says, And the rain was upon the earth forty days and forty nights. In verse 17, and the flood was forty days upon the earth, and the waters increased and bear up the ark, and it was lit up above the earth, and the waters prevailed, and were increased greatly upon the earth, and the ark went upon the face of the waters, and the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth, and all the high hills that were under the whole heaven were covered. You, you see then the, the change that came. And then it tells us in verse 24, And the waters prevailed upon the earth and 150 days. In Job chapter 22, Job chapter 22, from verse 15 and verse 16, it's telling us that God can suspend these laws of nature, and then the things you think are regular have always been like that, will always be like that. You find out everything, everything changes because of the judgment of God. Because nothing goes beyond the power of the Almighty God. Job chapter 22 verse 15. As thou march the old way which wicked men are trodden, which were caught down out of time whose foundation was overflown with a flood so the people knew the people knew even in the old testament that god could suspend and change all those laws of nature and so the scoffers as they came and they were saying since the fathers fell asleep all things have continued as they were even until this day they were willingly ignorant of the truth in isaiah chapter 28 Isaiah 28, verse 2 and verse 3, Behold, the Lord as, as a mighty and strong one, which as a tempest of hail and destroying storm, as a flood of mighty waters overflowing, shall cast down to the earth of the hand the crown of pride, the drunkards of Ephraim, shall be trodden under feet. That is, he is mighty enough to bring judgment, and he will do it. In Matthew chapter 24, from verse 36, Matthew 24, verse 36, But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark. And knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Here is the Lord Jesus Christ himself, church, 
uh, pay attention. You know, when it happens to other people, it's like, it will never happen to me. It can never happen to me. It's like this uh, HIV AIDS that is going all about. And uh, it comes through immorality. And as people are being warned, let's see, so and so caught it because of morality. So and so caught it because of morality. Some of these people are so sure, so confident, it can never happen to me. Whatever they do, they believe. They will always escape HIV and AIDS. And eventually, it happens to them. And if, if you look at backsliders today, some people that are brash and boasted, when they talk about backsliders in your, you know, as friends together, did you hear that brother so-and-so backslid? Did you hear that sister so-and-so backslid? After they're talking and they're talking and they're talking, then this fellow will brag and say, me, never, can never, never, never happen to me. Me, I am the son of the soil. I am the son of this church. I knew this church when I was very, very small. And now I've come to this stage. Whatever will happen, that I will ever backslide and leave a church like this, I will die before that time. Have you had some people say like that before? Some of them are now outside the door. The gate is open. They don't know how to come in. They are backsliding. Don't boast. Don't brag. All these people were thinking, when Christ will come, we will remain. It will never happen to me. I will never backslide. Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the flood came and he took all of them away. And then he said, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. He that thinketh a standeth, let him take heed, lest he fall. Don't say it can never happen to me. It can never happen to me. The people that brag before you, it's happened to them. And they are backsliding. And they are gone. And they don't know how to come back. May God have mercy on us. Amen. And so Jesus said, take the warning. Take the warning. It may happen. It can happen. In 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter Chapter 2, verse 5. Still talking about the flood. And he spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. He brought in the, the flood upon the world of the ungodly. In Luke chapter 17, Luke 17, from verse 27. Luke 17, verse 27. They did eat, Sodom and Gomorrah, or the people of Noah, Noah's day, they did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and, and the flood came, and destroyed them all, likewise also. As it was in the days of Lord, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted and they builded. But the same day that Noah went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. As the Lord is revealing all these things, I pray that uh, none of you will be like these coffers and doubters that deliberately close their eyes and close their minds to the truth of the word of God and eventually what they thought will never happen, eventually happen. Come back to Second Peter chapter, chapter 3 verse 7. Warning of future fiery punishment for scoffers and sinners. A warning of future fiery punishment for scoffers and sinners. In Second Peter chapter 3 verse 7. But the heavens and the earth which are now 
By the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. In the days of old, the judgment of the world was by water. The time of Noah. But you remember, it was followed by the judgment of Sodom and Gomorrah by fire. And it's an illustration for us that although the judgment of the world was at that time by water, the next judgment that is going to come that will affect the whole earth will be by fire. And then it tells us that we should be warned that this fire will come upon the whole earth. That's why it says in that verse 7, but the heavens and the earth, which are now, by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire, against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men, of unrighteous men, of unsaved men, of backsliding men and women. A single word of command from the Almighty God, over whom we have no control would cause a great conflagration in the heavens and the earth. The laws of nature have no stability independent of God's will. And at God's command, all things could be reduced to nothing, to ashes, by a word as easily as he created everything so he could do that and destroy at a moment of time. At any moment, it could suspend all the physical and natural laws and destroy the heavens and the earth. The heavens mentioned here, you know, obviously, is not talking about the place where God Almighty is dwelling, where he's living. The term is referring to the heavens as men see, as men know, as men explore. That is the galaxies and the stars and the orbits and all those things that we read about. The present system will be destroyed by fire. And then the new heavens and the new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness, will be created. In Psalm 50, verses 3 and 4, to tell us that the seas are going to be ruled up. And the Lord is going to destroy everything. And he's going to do it, not just quietly. He's going to destroy it by fire. And there will be a great noise. In Psalm 50, verses 3 and 4, our God shall come and shall not keep silence. A fire shall devour before him and it shall be very tempestuous round about him. He shall call to the heavens from above and to the earth that he may judge his people. That he may judge his people. Uh, you know, uh, there are people that act and behave as if there is no judgment. And God has left everybody, everything to be as they are. No judgment. But the judgment day will come. It may seem prolonged. It may seem as if I cannot see the evidence that judgment day is coming, but it's coming. It's like our children who go to school. And they refuse to do their assignment. And they refuse to read their books. But the D-Day is coming. The examination day is coming. It will come. They may waste time now. They may while away time now. They may do whatever they want to do to please themselves now. But that day will show whether they have been doing right or they have been doing wrong. The same thing in the program of God, in the economy of God, the judgment day will come and is going to judge his people. And the whole world is going to judge, is going to judge by fire. And it's uh, wonderful when you listen to the word of God. You, you know, sometimes when, when we hear the word of God, I've told you, I'm sure you know this, and sometimes the word of God is encouraging, sometimes the word of God is a warning, telling us that judgment will come. It's like, you know, somebody, let's say, for example, somebody does not like a Christian because he carries the Bible and he preaches Christ and all that. He is of another religion. But it so happens that there is an exposed electric wire. And this fellow that doesn't like the Christian is going to touch the wire and it can be electrocuted and can die just like that. And this person he doesn't like happens to be the one that has the knowledge that that danger is there. 
And he says, my friend, my friend, danger there, danger there, danger there. And the Pharaoh says, who is your friend? You are a Christian. I am not a Christian. Who is your friend? No, forget about that now. Danger, danger, danger. Don't go there. Don't touch that thing. Don't kill yourself. Leave me alone. I hate you. In fact, because you are even saying it, because it is you saying it, I'm going to touch that thing. And he kills himself just because he hates and he doesn't like the person giving him the warning. The truth is the truth. The word of God is the word of God. When you love God and you love the word of God, you love the messenger whom he has sent. And you do not reject the word of salvation and the word of repentance and the word of restitution and the word of holiness just because it is so and so that is saying it. Accept it for your own good. Judgment is coming upon the world. In Psalm 102, Psalm 102, Verses 25 and 26. 102 verse 25. Of old, as thou laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thine hand, they shall perish. The heavens and the earth, they shall perish. You find the earth mentioned in verse 25, and the heavens mentioned in verse 25, and they, the earth and the heavens, shall perish. But thou shalt endure. Yea, all of them shall wax old, like a garment, as a vesture. Shall thou change them, and they shall be changed. Isaiah chapter 51. Isaiah chapter 51, verse 6. Lift up your eyes to the heavens and look upon the earth beneath. For the heavens shall vanish away like smoke and the earth like wax. Old shall wax old as a garment. And they that dwell therein shall die in like manner. But my salvation shall be forever, and my righteousness shall not be abolished. Sephaniah chapter 3. Sephaniah chapter 3, verse 8. Therefore, wait ye upon me, says the Lord, until the day that I rise up to the prey, for my determination is to gather the nations that I may assemble the kingdoms to pour upon them my indignation, even all my fierce anger. For all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. You know, it says it over and over and over in so many books of the Old Testament. And even in the New Testament, it tells us the judgment that shall come upon the earth and the heavens and the inhabitants that are therein. In Matthew chapter 24, Matthew chapter 24, verse 35, heaven and earth shall pass away, will be rolled up, will be destroyed will be dissolved, consumed in the judgment of God. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Chapter 25 of Matthew verse 41. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. It shows you that God actually did not prepare hell for men. The creatures of his hand, the crown of his creation, and the image of his person. He loved man so much, and he didn't prepare hell for man. And even when after men fell, after Adam and Eve fell, and the whole world fell, he decided he would send the Lord Jesus Christ so that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. The way of salvation is open for everyone to come in into the peace, into the liberty, as well as into the freedom of the Almighty God so that everyone can escape hellfire, the judgment of the last day because hellfire was prepared only for Satan and his angels. But... There are people that, will, for one reason or the other, 
for a, a small thing, a minute thing. Might be fornication, might be adultery, might be stealing, might be lying, might be hypocrisy, might be malignity, might be backbiting, might be just gossiping, might be abortion, might be murder, might be because of idolatry or because of witchcraft or because of the little, little things that make the minds of people to go away from the Lord. Things you could easily repent of and turn away because of five, ten, one, five minutes or ten uh, minutes of enjoyment in sinful pleasure. They seal their doom and they go to hell. And hell was not prepared for man, but just for Satan and his angels. But because they, they refused. They refused to hear the voice of him that cried, that warned. Eventually it says in verse 46, And these shall go away into everlasting punishment. And it wasn't for them. It wasn't for them. It wasn't for them. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment. I pray God will give us ear in ear. In Revelation chapter 20, Revelation chapter 20, from verse 11, Revelation 20, verse 11, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. You know, we read it in the Old Testament. We're reading the New Testament. The earth and the heavens will be destroyed by fire. Here it says, the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no more place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great. And I saw the dead, young and old. And I saw the dead, small, little, and big. And I saw the dead, poor and rich. And I saw the dead, weak and mighty. And I saw the dead, illiterate and educated. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. My brothers and sisters, let's be serious. Look up here. Every evil thing you do without repentance goes on record. It's written down. Every lie you tell without repentance, without apology, without correction goes on record. Every act of sin, every act of transgression that you commit without cleansing it with the blood of Jesus goes on record. Your wife may not know. Your husband may not know. Your pastor may not know. The believers may not know. Every evil sin you do that you do not repent of, it goes on record. You may forget, but it's in the book of God. It's on record. And if you do not examine yourself, if you do not search yourself, if you do not repent and turn away from them, because God is of purer eyes than to behold iniquity, all those things are going on record. And you cannot come before God and say, I'm righteous, I'm holy, I'm just, I'm sanctified, I'm a good church member. They will open the books. They said, I saw the small, I saw them small and great. They stand before God. And the books were open. And the dead were judged according to the things that were written down. And then it tells us here in verse 13 and the sea gave up the dead which were in it and the de and death and hell it says they were delivered up they delivered up the dead which were in them and then it says they were judged everyone according to the word according to their words and then here it says in verse 14 and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire this is the second death and whosoever God is to respect our persons. Whosoever, whosoever was found, was not found, written in the book of life, was cast into the lake of fire. Where will you be on that day? When the last trumpet shall sound. And then you face the judgment of God. And the day of mercy is gone. And the day of praying is gone. And the day of making amends is gone. Where will you be? Oh, what a weeping and wailing. As the lost were told of their fate, you'll cry. They cried for the rocks and the mountains. They prayed, but their prayer was too late. I dreamed that the great judgment morning had dawned and the trumpet had blown. I dreamed that the nations had gathered before to judgment before the white throne. From the throne came a bright shining angel and stood 
on the land and the sea. And he swore with his hands raised to heaven that time shall be no more. It's going to happen. We may laugh today. It will not be a laughing matter at that time because the rich man was there. But his money had melted and vanished away. A pauper is stood in the judgment. His debts were too heavy to pay. The great man was there. But his greatness, when death came, was left far behind. The angel that opened the records. The records are there. The records are there. The angels that opened the records. Not a trace of his greatness could find. But the widow was there with the orphans. God had heard and remembered their cry. No sorrow in heaven forever. God wiped all tears from their eyes. The gambler will be there. And a drunkard. And the man that had sold them the drink. For the people who gave him the license. Together in hell did he sing. The moral man came to the judgment. I'm better than that publican. I'm better than everybody else. Although I don't go to church. Although I don't read the Bible. Check up my life. I'm better than those church goers. You'll be there. But the self-righteous rags would not do. The men who had crucified Jesus have passed up as moral men too. The soul that has put off salvation. Not tonight. Not tonight. Look at the time. Look at the time. Not tonight. I'm in a hurry. I need to get back home in time. Not tonight. I'll get saved by and by. No time now to think of religion. At last. At last. At last. They had found time to die. Oh, what a weeping and wailing. As the lost were told of their faith. They cried for the rocks and the mountains. They prayed. They prayed. They prayed. It will be too late at that time. They prayed. But... The prayer was too late. Why don't you rise up and tell the Lord the time of mercy is still there now. The time of forgiveness is still there now. The time when you can change and the time when you can submit and surrender before the cross and before Calvary. That time is still there now. If you wait too long, if you wait too long, if you wait too long, you may cry at that time, but your prayer will be too late. Don't be a scoffer. Don't be a doubter. Don't say it cannot happen to me. Don't say I am saved and forever saved. There is no eternal security. And God's eyes are watching you. God is keeping record. All the things you do that you do not repent of, everything goes on record. Whether you believe it or not. It goes on record. It goes on record. It goes on record. And on the final day, they will open the books. The books will be opened. And everything you have done in secret, everything you have done with a hardened heart, everything you have done that I don't care, everything will come because it's on record. Because it's on record. Where will you be on that final day when the books are opened and your adultery will be revealed and your immorality will be revealed and your stealing will be revealed and your hypocrisy will be revealed? And your pretense will be revealed. And your drunkenness will be revealed. And your smoking will be revealed. And your licentious life with those little, little girls, those teenage school children, your licentious life, your immoral life will be revealed. And your witchcraft will be revealed. And your familiar spirit will be revealed. Where will you be on that day? Where you, will you be on that day? Oh, what are we pain and wailing? As the lost were told of their faith, they'll cry, they'll cry, they'll cry. They cry to the rocks and the mountains, but their prayer will be too late. Call upon the Lord today. Call upon the Lord today. Today is the day of forgiveness. Today is the day of the love of God. Today is the, is the day of mercy. If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways and seek my face and pray unto me, I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin. I will heal their land. He that covereth the sin shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. If you cover it up, you cannot prosper. If you cover it up, you cannot be forgiven. If you cover it up, you cannot be saved. He that covereth a sin shall not prosper. He that covereth a sin shall not prosper. But whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. To get free from sin, you'll be violent with that sin. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of God suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God. The kingdom of God sovereign violence. And the violent take it by force. You'll be forceful against that immorality. Forceful against a bad company. 
forceful against the gang that is trying to make you remain in sin and remain in immorality and remain in evil you call upon the lord you call upon the lord and say lord lord i give myself to you i repent of my sin i repent of my evil i repent of the backsliding my come back home don't wait until it becomes too late don't wait until it becomes too late call upon the lord today he that has been often reproved and hardness his neck will perish without remedy that's the word of god we cannot stop coaching the word of god repent call upon the name of the lord let him forgive you wash you make you clean put away the evil of your doing before mine eyes learn to do well cease to do evil then come now and let us receive together says the lord Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be whiter than snow. And though they be like crimson, they will wash you white as wool. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. Call upon the name of the Lord. This is your chance to be saved. This is your chance to be purged and purified and cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. So that iniquity will not be your ruin. Call upon the Lord today before it is too late.